Today's reading comes from Matthew 16, verses 21 through 25. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hand of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Gracious Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight this day, O oh Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I am uh, uh, grateful to Brooks uh, coming last week and preaching. I heard he did a great job and, and uh, many good things. I know Charlie and Pam were proud to have their son here, uh, and he is a son of this church as well, and so I know many people were glad to see him. And uh, he, he's kind of a fiery preacher, I tell you. He, he, uh, you're not going to fall asleep on Brooks, I tell you. Uh, and I discovered why. He had an energy drink he left back here. I had to throw it away. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, so that, you know, there you go. Secrets out, secrets out. Well, we're beginning uh, this morning in a new uh, sermon series called Relational Vampires. It's a series that looks at how do we deal with difficult people in our lives and and what can we learn from these kind of relationships how can we learn to to behave as christians uh, how can we be the best christians we can be in light of dealing with difficult people in our lives in particular we're going to look at three types of difficult relationships or difficult people if you will the first of which uh, we're going to look at, at controlling people uh, that's the sermon for today. How do we deal with people that try to control us and manipulate us in those ways? Uh, next week, we're going to look at critical people, those people that just seem to nitpick and nag, and oh, they're just so critical of every little thing we do. Uh, and then in the following week after that, we're going to look at needy people, people that just ask and need and need and want and want and want, and just how do you deal with people that just take this from you, you know, all the time. They just never calm down. Uh, we call them relational vi vampires because they are the kind of people who in various ways uh, like vampires suck blood from their victims they suck the life from their victims you, you know what I mean it's this old uh, I want to suck your blood you know that's the old vampire saying uh, for these type of people it's like I want to suck the life out of you and and they do if you let them if you allow them to be that person in your life they are the type of people who, after having been around them for maybe a little while or a long while, you walk away feeling as if your life has been drained. You're either hurt uh, or they have taken something from you or you are burdened or you are lifeless in some way, shape, or form. So that's what we're going to look at today uh, in the next uh, few weeks, those type of people that take something from you. And today we're focusing on controlling people, people that seek to control you or control us, and they do that in various ways. Now, my first real experience with a controlling person uh, happened back when I was a student at Texas Tech University, uh, Red Raiders, Reckon Red Texas Tech, all that kind of good stuff. Got some guns up there, you go, all right. Uh, Aggies are there going, eh, whatever, yeah, that's right, okay. But, uh, you know, I, I you know, it, for those that are from SFA, I want you to know God's symbol up there, that's not the SFA symbol upside down. You see the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit? That's, that's a blessing symbol, but SFA is this, right? Axum Jacks? Okay. All right, there we go. So we got all our co schools covered. We'll see who's going to win the championship coming up soon. All right. So my first real experience dealing with a controlling person was back in uh, college, back when I was at Texas Tech. I was a full-time student. I was working part-time, and I also volunteered 
for a youth ministry. It was a parachurch organization that, that reached students that weren't connected to churches, and they would provide what they called club, which is basically the youth group, uh, and they would meet weekly and, and invite students that weren't connected to churches to come and to be a part of the club. And uh, it was aimed at high school students, this in particular one was, and I volunteered for it. Uh, I uh, really enjoyed it at first. It was really kind of fun and exciting to be a part of this ministry, and, and uh, I had benefited from it when I was in high school and had a great time with it. However, it became something it wasn't meant to be, in part because of the leader at that time, a, a man who we'll call Jim. Uh, Jim was uh, the, the paid uh, director of this particular Young Life Club, and there were two volunteers, myself, uh, and then uh, one other fella, I, as, a, as I said, was a full-time student and working a part-time job and then volunteering on the side to do, do this ministry. And this other fella was, uh, was a college graduate who was, had a full-time job, and, uh, and he was volunteering on the side to do this kind of ministry. My nickname uh, was Bus Driver. They called me bus driver. The reason they called me bus driver uh, was that I would go and get a van from one of the local churches who loaned us their van, and I would go and pick up the kids. Now, where this was was on the east side of Lubbock, a, a poor section of Lubbock, uh, mostly minority schools that we were focusing on, and a lot of the kids didn't have cars, families didn't even have cars. And so we would go around, I'd drive the van around, I would pick the kids up. And then after the club was over, I'd go and take them home. So I got the nickname bus driver. That was my that was my job. Now, our leader, Jim, <clears throat> was passionate about this. <clears throat> Excuse me. He had a very passionate heart for reaching kids for Christ. And I don't, I don't uh, blame him for that at all. That's wonderful. That's great. However, his, 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 uh, his idea of wanting to be successful in this ministry uh, went a little further than I believe it should have. He was wanting this to be successful no matter what. His ministry was more important than his family. His ministry was more important than his time with his wife. His ministry was more important than anything that myself or the other volunteer was doing. What we were doing with this ministry was more important. At least that's the way he saw it and the way that he wanted us to see it as well. All that mattered to him, the most important thing in his life, the number one thing in his life was to see this ministry be successful. It didn't matter that I was a full-time student with a part-time job and doing this on the side. It didn't matter if the other volunteer was a full-time employee somewhere else. And it didn't matter. He expected you, Jim expected you to have the same, to, to invest the same amount of time and energy and efforts that he did into this ministry. And he was not above using guilt and manipulation and sometimes threats in order to get you to do what he wanted you to do. He fell into the category, if you will, of a controlling person. It didn't matter if you had another job. It didn't matter if you were a student. Those things were not important to him. What was important to him was seeing his ministry successful. Now, if I had a big test the next day or if I had uh, something, I, a project I had to work on, that didn't matter to Jim. Uh, you, it, I, I, just, I was always in fear of going to him and saying, Jim, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to make club meeting tonight or I'm not going to be able to make the leaders meeting tonight because I knew that he, he would say, oh, you're, David, what are you doing? How, how, can, how can you do this to the kids? You know, this is, there's only three of us. We need you. You, you have to just don't worry about it. Your, your test will be fine. These are things that he said to me as a leader, as a volunteer. And, and they were inappropriate and unhealthy. I was afraid of, of letting him down or letting the kids down because of this guilt I was beginning to take on. I was accepting it, this guilt that he was dishing out. As time went on, Jim continued to demand more and more of us. We were his only volunteers, the only ones who, who were really willing to volunteer with him. It, 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 probably everybody else was smarter than us. <laughs> they realized the way he operated, and we didn't, but we just kind of went along with it because, uh, you know, for whatever reason. Uh, maybe everybody else knew better, but Jim's controlling and demanding behavior got stronger and more and more and more. It wasn't that we were slackers. I wasn't a slacker. I was working very hard, trying to get all my studies done, get the projects done, get the papers done, get ready for tests. I was working, like I said, a part-time job, so I have some spending money while I was at college. And so it wasn't that I was a slacker or anything like that. But you would think, based on what Jim was saying to me, that I was just being lazy. But that wasn't the case at all. 
at that time in my life, I, in essence, became a Christian workaholic because I was trying really busy to, to please Jim and to make Jim happy and do all these things. And so I was running around, and, and my grades were beginning to suffer. And, and not only was it affecting my grades and my schooling at that time, it was also affecting me physically. I, I was just the stress of it and the worry of it and the, and the and ringing my fingers. I, 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 had to, I ended up going to see a doctor about it because it was affecting me in that way. I was young. And I didn't know better. And and if I could go back and and now having hindsight of 2020, looking back at it and go and talk to my younger self back then when I was 19 years old or uh, 20 years old or whatever it was, I I would sit myself down and say, listen, you have been given this time of your life to prepare you for the rest of your life. You're a student. Be a student. That's what God's called you to be at this season of your life. You'll have plenty of time later on for full-time ministry. But right now, Yeah, volunteering, helping out, that's not a big deal. Do it in the time that's allowed, but know that your priority, who you're called to be at this time, is a student. The whole experience of of ministry with Jim put a lot of pressure on me, and it was stress, and and like I said, uh, long story short, I ended up dropping out from school for a semester. I I don't think geography changes are a good solution to, to most problems, but at that time in my life, that's all I knew how to do to get out of that situation. I had to get some help from some other people to help me see what was going on. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But I ended up taking a semester off from school in order to get out of that, that very negative and, and, and very unhealthy relationship, that controlling relationship that I was experiencing from this fellow. Now, through it all, I learned some very important lessons. I, I look back on that. Yes, it was difficult. Yes, it was hard. But I believe I'm a better leader. I'm a better pastor. Uh, I hope I'm a better head of staff, if you will. I hope I'm a, a better uh, pastorally with you guys and, and working with volunteers and things like that. I hope I'm much better at that now. But part of that is because I learned difficult lessons uh, through that time. Now, maybe you can relate. Maybe you face someone like that, be it a boss or uh, who, who has uh, expectation demands that are just uh, uh, that use manipulation to try to get you to do things and, and, and whatnot. Maybe it's a, a manipulative family member who, who's controlling. They want things done their way, and so they do things that, that, that are unhealthy in order to try to get you to go along with whatever it is they want done. Maybe it's a so-called friend who tries to control you or tries to limit you from, you can't go hang out with them, you need to hang out with me, whatever it may be. Sometimes it's because they're insecure. Sometimes it's because they're, they're so success-oriented, they just see you as a means to an end. Sometimes it's uh, just that they're hurting people. And as I've said before, I'll say it again, hurting people hurt people. Sometimes it's uh, because you know, they're a parent or an in-law who, who just wants things done their way and they, they've always gotten their way and they expect you to go along with everybody else. You know if you've been around this kind of person because it's exhausting. They take the life right out of you. They suck the life right out of you. This is who I want us to look at this morning. Controlling people have two main, uh, ar- uh, two main weapons in their arsenal, if you will. Two main ways in which they seek to get you to do what they want you to do or or seek to get them to be, uh, the way I describe it sometimes is is a controlling person and is a type of person who thinks that they're the center of the universe and that everybody else is supposed to, you know, uh, know, follow their gravitational pull and and circle around. So, So they use two main tools to get you to make sure they're at the center of the universe. And the first tool they use is, in their their first weapon, I guess, in their arsenal is, is that of threats. They threaten you. They, they threaten you by, by, by uh, uh, acting like they're going to blow up or, or get mad, or, or they threaten you by thinking they're going to cause a scene. They, 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 they use threats. It can be small. It can be simple. It can even be implied, or it can be grandiose and big. They want you to fear what they might do if you don't do what they want you to do. You better perform or you will be punished. In other words, if you don't do what you, they want you to do, then you're going to pay in the end. It can be unrealistic expectations of a boss who threatens you with a demotion or, or to move you to another department or even a loss of a job. It could be a boyfriend who says they'll break up with you if you don't do things with them that 
they want you to do. They'll threaten you. It could be a mother-in-law who, 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 who you know will blow up or cause a scene at Thanksgiving or Christmas or the next get-together if, if you don't go along with what they're wanting you to do. Threats. That's number one. Here's number two. The second arsenal, weapon in their arsenal is guilt. They'll heap on the guilt. They'll say things that, that make you feel guilty. They'll either do it directly or they'll do it an implied kind of a way. They'll say things like, well, after all I've done for you, you can't just do this one little thing for me. Well, that one little thing is, is one of many little things they've been trying to get you to do. Oh, I thought we were friends and you can't even do something like that for me. You know? Uh, you call yourself a Christian and you won't do this for me? I guess you're too busy to call your dear old mother. Sorry, is that too close to home? <laughs> I could be rotten in my house for two whole weeks and no one would ever know it because you never check on me. Threats and guilt. They're just tools of manipulation. They're tools to, to try to put some sort of fear or anxiety in you. That they're trying to put a fire under you because they're trying to get you to do what? Keep them at the center of the universe and allow you know, everything else to go circle around them so that they're the center of it all. In our Bible passage today, we hear the story of Jesus and the disciples. And Jesus is telling the disciples about what is fixing to happen. That, that he is uh, about to go and become the sacrificial lamb who gives his life for the world. So the world may be forgiven and know that salvation through Jesus Christ. That he's going to have to suffer. That he's going to have to die. And that he will be raised three days later. Well, what happens? Peter grabs him. And, 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 and is sitting there going, wait a second. Suffer? Killed? Uh, raised on the third day? Are you kidding me? Not on my watch. Well, read what he's, listen along what he says in verse 22. It says, Peter took him aside, took Jesus aside, and began to rebuke him. Never, he said, this shall not happen to you. Now, how's Jesus respond to that? Listen to the next verse. Verse 23. He says, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have the mind uh, in mind the concerns of who? God. But merely, you're only concerned about human concerns, right? Wow. I wonder what that must have been like for, for Peter to hear Jesus say those words so boldly and so strongly. I wonder what that would have been like for the other disciples who were, who were off to the side. Because remember, Peter pulled Jesus off the side who saw this, what was going on. Now, hear me out. I, I don't see Peter as the malicious kind of controlling person, okay? I don't want to paint him in a, in a bad light here. However, he was acting controlling by what he was doing. And he was using yet another tool in the toolbox, if you will. That is, he was using isolation to get Jesus to do what he wanted to do. You've got to identify that when it happens. See, if, 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 if Peter can get Jesus off to the side, then he can convince Jesus to do what he needed to do. Why? Because he doesn't want a controller doesn't want outside influences inhibiting or, or getting in the way of them getting their way. And so we see controlling people pulling people aside because they can have more power over them if they will. But as we know, Jesus would have none of it, and he stood his ground against Peter's controlling actions, and in doing so, he teaches us three things that we need to know when dealing with controlling people. The first thing we need to know when we're dealing with controlling people is this. You need to know what you're called to do. If you're going to face controlling people in the world, if you're going to be able to deal with them in a healthy way, you need to know what you're called to do. And I would add to that, you need to know what you're called to be. Jesus told his disciples that I've come to seek and save the lost. I've come to give my life as a ransom for many. I've come to save people from the sins. I've come to that people may have life and life abundant. Jesus knew who he was. He knew what he was called to do. He knew what he was called to be. And he wasn't willing to swerve from that or go in another direction just to meet the needs of some controlling person. We need to know what we're called to do. And we need to know who we're called to be. I'm called to be a preacher. I'm called to be a child of God. I'm called to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm called to be a loving and faithful husband to my wife, Kimberly. I'm called to be a good parent to Reagan and Rebecca. It's important to, need, to know that you're, what you're called to do so that when, you, when the person tries to sidetrack you, 
you can say, well, that doesn't necessarily fit into who I am or what I'm called to do. For example, when I was at Texas Tech, what was I called to do for that period of time in my life? I was called to be a student. That was my number one goal. That's why God had me in Lubbock, Texas. I wasn't realizing that. Luckily, with the help of some other people that, 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 that kind of think through this and process through this, what I realized was Jim was trying to get me to do something that wasn't what God had called me to do. And it wasn't who God had called me to be at that time. We've got to remember these things about ourselves. When someone wants you to go do this or that, you need to remember, hey, this is who I am. It wasn't until after all of, of uh, 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 that was going on and, 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 and going through the experience of dealing with Jim, as I said, with the help of other people, that I realized, wow, Jim was trying to get me off track. And it's okay to be a student when you're at college. Jim wanted to make me feel guilty about that, and that was wrong. I was called. So that's number one. You need to realize what you're called to do and who you're called to be. Number two... You need to know when someone is trying to control you. You need to know when someone is trying to control you. Jesus wasn't blinded by Peter's attempts to control him. Peter's attempts to move him off God's agenda. Remember, Peter is not the bad guy here. He means well. He, he, uh, he, he, he thinks he's saying what is in Jesus' best interest, but he's still being a controlling person, and Jesus knew that. Sometimes that's hard to identify in our lives. I know it was for me early on. And what it took in order for me to discover what was going on with myself and to discover the controlling nature of the relationship that I had was that God had to bring some other people into my life to give me perspective. I, that, remember the old tactic of isolation? A controlling person wants to isolate you so that you won't have anybody else who might show you the light? about what is going on, you need your friends. You need people in your life that are outside of that situation, maybe outside of even that group of friends, maybe outside of your immediate family, maybe outside of whatever it may be, who you can go to, who will help you to know when someone is trying to control you. I can remember when I was young, in college, I, I didn't understand what was going on. All I knew was I felt guilty, I felt burdened, I, I, I was anxiety-filled, I was worried, I was running around, I was trying to be everything for everybody, I was trying to please everybody, that's what we all tend to do sometimes. And, and, and it wasn't until God put some people in my life to say, David, stop a minute. Do you realize what's going on? And with that godly wisdom from other people, helping me to see things a little more clearly, I was able to have the light bulb go off and go, oh my gosh. So this is wrong. And it's okay to be who I was called to be in that situation, which was a student. It's amazing when you find out, when you know what's going on, and you get heap people to help you to discover when that is. Remember, controlling people use isolation. God has given you others. Talk to people you trust. If you're feeling that place of guilt and, or you don't understand what's going on or you just feel this burden in this relationship, talk to somebody. Process it. They'll help you along the way. Here's the third thing we need to know. First is you need to know who you are, or basically what, what you're supposed to do and who you're supposed to be so that people don't get you off track from that. Second, you need to know when someone is trying to control you. And third, you need to know when to draw a line in the sand. Okay? You need to know when it is to draw a line in the sand. Now, here's what you need to do the next time Grandma comes up to you and tries to make you feel guilty about not visiting her anymore. You just pull a playbook out of Jesus, out of Jesus playbook, and you look at her and say, Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> Try that. Okay, don't. Or if you do, prepare to be slapped. Okay? No, don't do that. Don't do that at all. That was Jesus. Jesus was able to do that. I wouldn't recommend you try and go out and say to, to grandma or someone else, get behind me, Satan. It, it, it's not going to work. Now, you know, there are some things that are reasonable and expected. Let's say you have a boss, and the boss expects you to work uh, on the weekends uh, every so often. Uh, if that's in your job description... You know, to be on call or to do weekends or do late nights, then that's reasonable and expected. That's not controlling behavior. But if it's not in your job description, 
and, and, and you have a boss that's putting pressure on you or trying to make you feel guilty or threatening you, uh, if you don't do this and da-da-da and all this kind of stuff, that's a whole nother story. And there does come a time and a place where you draw the line. If, if uh, um, it, it, there's all, I, I can't, I can go into several situations there, but the bottom line is it, it does challenge you. And you must realize that if you are going to draw the line, that there will be some cost in that. They may get upset. At the same time, they may actually respect you more. But either way, you've got to be prepared for however it is they are going to respond. And you also need to realize that you're not responsible for how they respond. God has given you responsibility for yourself. God has given you the responsibility to say yes and yes and no and no and no and to say yes and no and to say no. He's given you the power to do that. There might be risks that you have to take when you say yes and when you say no, when you set up those boundaries and when you draw the line in the sand. But it's important to do that. Because if you don't, then all you're going to be is controlled, manipulated, and, and burdened, and you're going to go around guilty all the time, and you're going to be, your life is going to be miserable. Now, how do we know when to do that? How do, how do we know when to draw the line in the sand? Let me give you two suggestions. The first one we've already talked about, and that is perspective. You've got to get perspective in these things. That's why, once again, go to somebody you trust. Go to somebody you look up to. Go to somebody who's in your group of friends who you can talk to about a situation, whatever it may be. Hey, I'm feeling pressure in this sort of thing. I, I think I might be, uh, you know, I know I'm being controlled here, but I, I don't know where are my boundaries. I don't know where I need to say no. I don't know what, you know, help me think through the risks. Help me think through how I can, uh, how I can talk to this person in a healthy way. Maybe even coach me in that. Say, how, how can I, and I don't want to cow down every time, but, but can you coach me on, and what are some of the ways they might try to go back against me if I need to talk to them and set my line in the sand and, and set my boundaries with them? Use the people that God has placed in your life. They're there for a reason. We're here for one another. We're better together. We need each other. Uh, that's number one, but not in order of priority. The number one in order of priority is what I have on my list as number two, and that is, uh, the first is pers uh, perspective, getting perspective from other people. The second is prayer. You need to pray about these things. Don't just rush in and do whatever you think you need to do. You need to sit down and go before God and say, God, I need wisdom here. I, I can't do this on my own. I need your insight. James uh, says in James chapter 1, verse 5, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. So if you're dealing with a difficult situation, if you're dealing with a difficult person, if you're dealing with a controlling person and you know it's time to draw the line in the sand and you know it's going to be hard, pray that God would give you wisdom to know what to say and how to say it. And that wisdom may come to you through the Scriptures, that wisdom may come to you through the Spirit, that wisdom may come to you through others, but allow God to speak. Go to Him in prayer. Now, as I said a minute ago, uh, some people in these situations will actually respect you more when you do this. And some of it, they don't realize what they're doing until someone is willing to set up a boundary for them. And others, they'll, do, they'll go off the rails. But remember, you're not responsible for how they respond. You're responsible for how you respond. And you're also responsible to know. To know what you're called to do and to be in any given situation to know when someone is trying to control you, so use help of other people to figure that out, and also to know when to draw a line in the sand. Pray about it and get other people's perspective to help you. Now, I want to make a recommendation for you. If you're dealing with something like this, or you have been, or, or you currently are, there's a great book out there I want to recommend for you. It's called Boundaries. It's written by Henry Cloud and, and John Townsend. It's Boundaries, When to Say Yes, How to Say No to Take Control of your life. I found that book very helpful. I've recommended it many times to other people, and they found it helpful as well. So let me recommend that to you. Either way, uh, let me pray for us this morning as we close. Because uh, I know these type of, type of struggles can be very personal and, and very difficult. And so I want us just to take some time as we come to the close of our service this morning to pray. Would you bow with your heads with me?
Gracious Lord, I want to lift up to you my brothers and sisters in Christ. And Father, it is difficult at times to deal with difficult people. It's emotionally hard. It's draining on a person. Uh, we don't like to disappoint others. We want people to feel good. Sometimes the things that they want us to do are important or seem important. And, and, and you know, and Lord, we, we struggle. And so I pray, Lord, for my brothers and sisters, and myself included, that you, by the power of your Spirit, would work in our lives to help us to be the healthy people we need to be in this life. Lord, to have the courage and strength to know uh, or, or when it is time to draw the line in the sand, uh, to have the courage and strength to say yes when we need to say yes and no when we need to say no. And Lord, help us to love even the most difficult of people with the love of Jesus Christ. Thank you for making us who we are. And thank you for loving us enough not to leave us there. Transform our hearts and lives, O oh Lord, in Jesus Christ. This we pray in Jesus' name.